Um, the first thing is we did that onion root tip last week. So that was due today. Um, the Google world said Sunday. I didn't even notice until I received a couple of emails. Um, so you'll, you probably have it in, but if you don't have it in, um, you want to get that in today. And then also, um, I got some emails about, I clearly missed a, um, missed putting in the data for the cancer group. So I had put it in as a class comment. So if you didn't see the class comment, um, and so you weren't able to finish that assignment, take a notice. Um, so under mitosis lab, you should have um, a class comment right here. So then there's the numbers we needed to conduct that last piece. Okay, so write those down um or just know where to find them so that you can write them down later some background knowledge i am not going to go and lecture on the vocabulary related to meiosis but here is um my vocabulary this is actually um the powerpoint i do with my biology kids so if you had me in biology you've already seen it um but it's basically what it is and what it is not because um, I think that we can have some misconceptions. So my what it is not is usually what students often confuse it with, okay? So I'll just let you um, look at that on your own, um, but it's, we need to have working knowledge of the vocabulary, right? In order to be able to talk about meiosis. So that's that. Um, what else we got? So. We're gonna do the meiosis lecture today. I'm gonna to swap these. I have an activity that allows you to practice with alternation of generation, which is the most difficult of the three life cycles. So here I put on your own, spend time with the life cycles. You'll wanna spend a little extra time with each of those. Um, but I did put an activity in for alternation of generation. It's the plant life cycle. So you can uh, do that today. And then I have this meiosis case study, which turns out to be relatively easy, but it investigates the SRY uh, gene, which I think is pretty interesting. Here we go. So when we talk about meiosis, we get to talk about the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. So mitosis, we talked about that as an example of asexual reproduction. Um, something to recognize is that when we talk about either of these, we're talking about numbers of cells, not necessarily number of parents, okay? So I do have two parents and one parent, but truly you're just saying one cell or two cells. Okay, so asexual reproduction, you want to recognize that that's gonna create clones, identical copies, right? So they all look the same. They'll all have the exact same genetic material so um, we can refer to them as clones. Okay, so um, sexual reproduction requires two cells. Those cells sometimes come from the same parent. And that's why I said, be careful um, when we say two parents, we mean, we mean two parent cells. So rather than producing clones, we're gonna produce uh, genetic variations um, within the offspring. You will want to know these three items. I have seen these in FRQs. How do we get genetic variation through sexual reproduction? Okay, um, mutation and crossing over that happens during synthesis phase of DNA mutations, crossing over, which happens during prophase of meiosis. Random fertilization, any egg can be fertilized by any sperm. So there's a mathematical variation there. Independent assortment, which happens during um, metaphase when the chromosomes line up at the equator and they don't line up the same way every single time. So each of these lead to variation in the um, daughter cells and therefore variation in the offspring as a whole. And because of that, anytime there's variation, there's a chance for evolution. Um, because one variant is likely to be better suited for an environment than another. And so if you're better suited, you're more likely to survive to pass on that gene. And that is what evolution is all about. Okay, so um, sexual 
Reproduction involves fertilization and fertilization comes in different forms, right? So in this first example, um, we have algae. Algae use a, a conjugation tube. So this is two different algae strands or it could be the same algae strand. Um, but you have a conjugation tube between the two cells. And so you'll see the genetic material, not the entire cell, but just the nucleus is going to move from one cell into the other. And so that allows those two nuclei to combine together in the zygote. And then um, with plants, when you talk about um, sexual reproduction, you're going to use pollination, right? The combination of the pollen um, and the ovule or the, ov yeah, we'll say the ovule. Um, and then in, in animals, we would talk about fertilization, as in the egg and the sperm come together. And this process might be called copulation. So animals, the process itself, the physical process, we would refer to as copulation. Okay, so a quick comparison, you should be able to compare and contrast, meaning find similarities and differences between meiosis and me meiosis. So mitosis has only one division, whereas meiosis has two divisions. So it goes through the phases twice. Last week, we talked about mitosis occurring in somatic cells, soma being bodies. So like in your skin cells, in your eye cells, in your hair cells, meiosis only occurs in germ cells. They produce gametes. A lot of times we say meiosis occurs in gametes. That gamete is not going to divide again, okay? So it's occurring in a germ cell, which is the cells that produce gametes. Those germ cells are found in for animals in the gonads. Um, so mitosis, the purpose accomplishes growth, repair, and asexual reproduction, whereas meiosis is specifically preparing for sexual reproduction in order to keep the chromosome number the same, okay? So it produces four haploid cells through th two divisions, which allows us to um, cut our chromosome number in half before we're able to combine it together during sexual reproduction. So the goal is simply to reduce the chromosome number in half. So it's called a reduction division. And here's another place where students are often confused. They think that the reduction happens the second division because you take one and you split it in half and then you split it in half again. But really the reduction happens during the first division because in synthesis, we make copies right? And then we separate our copies in the first phase. So at that point, you've cut your chromosome number in half. In the second phase, you're separating sisters, which are identical. So they're not, um, so each cell is really getting the same of that chromosome, if you will. I'm going to explain that better as we go. Um, so here's a preview, just a little animation um, of what this looks like. So this is on Cells Alive, and we'll watch as we go through these phases. It'll go kind of quick, um, so try to observe the chromosomes, the centrioles, the anchor, the spindle fibers, and the division of the nucleus. So here we go. So that happened really fast. During pro phase one, um, you're going to have a pairing of chromid, we're going to have a pairing of homologous chromosomes. So homologous chromosomes carry the same genetic information. They're the same size shape, centromere position. They are not identical. So this is like dad's copy of your hair and eye color. This is mom's copy of your hair and eye color. This is dad's copy of your height and weight. This is mom's copy of your height and weight, for example. Okay, spindle fibers are forming along this with the centrioles. Moving into metaphase, notice the homologs are aligned at the equator. So at this point, we're separating mom's and dad's versions. So we no longer have two copies of each. We only have one copy of each. Okay, so in prophase, now we're talking about sister chromatids. The sister chromatids line up at the equator. These are identical copies, so they technically are the same, right? It's dad's copy of your eye color, mom's copy of your weight. Separate the sisters during anaphase two. Telophase two separates the final um, nuclei. 
forming four gametes. Any questions so far? Um, so during prophase one, um, chromosomes condense just like they did in mitosis. Sister chromatids are going to be paired just like they were in mitosis, but this time we're also going to pair up homologs. So the homologs are the similar versions, so they carry the same genetic information, whether or not you're going to have myopia, for example, whether or not you'll have Huntington's disease, for example. So um, the sister chromatids are paired up, and then they pair with another set of sisters that carry the same genetic information. So this forms a tetrad. Tetra means four. So this is your tetrad. So there's a synapse of the four, just like you have um, in the nervous system, for example, we talk about synapses between cells where two cells come together. So this is where four chromatids come together. At this point, a lot of times there's crossing over that occurs. This creates genetic variation because now part of mom's chromosome is stuck on part of dad's chromosome. So it forms a recombinant, a different genetic code than you had before. So this is showing you all of the um, tetrads. See how they're in groups of four coming together. So the spindle fibers will attach to the kinetochores just like before. During metaphase, we have homologs at the equator rather than sister chromatid. So metaphase one homologs. Notice you have only one set of chromosomes facing each centromere, or I'm sorry, each centriole or each pole. So at this point, you're gonna get either dads or moms. You're not gonna get both. So at this point, you're preparing to reduce your division. So there's random assortment, meaning every time this chromosome, these chromosomes line up, they'll line up differently. So chromosome number one is not connected to chromosome number two. Just because chromosome number one lines up on the left does not mean chromosome number two has to line up at the left. Each time you're gonna flip the coin, and you're gonna get one or the other, okay? So independent of each other. You need to know this mathematical process. So um, fruit flies have four chromosomes and they have two versions, right? One from mom, one from dad. So the two is referring to the versions, mom and dad. The superscript, or the power is referring to how many different pairs. So to calculate the number of possible combinations of gametes, how many different ways can you line these up? You will have two to the fourth. So variations versus chromosomes, okay? So two to the fourth different combinations. So if you had four pairs of chromosomes, you could sort them out in 16 different ways. In humans, we have 23 different pairs, moms, dads, that's two, to the 23rd, 23 different pairs. Eight million plus combinations of gametes that you could produce, just you, right? So then if you wanted to know how many different combinations of zygotes you and your partner could produce, you'd have to multiply those two together. So that would be eight, eight million blah, 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 squared. Chimpanzees have 24 different pairs of chromosomes, so you would say two to the 24th. I usually give you one of these math problems on the test, okay? Metaphase one, homologs are lined up at the equator. Anaphase one, homologs are separating. So if, I, if a question includes homolog at all, if a question includes homolog at all, you know you're in meiosis one, okay? So here um, you can see the homologs are being pulled apart. So now you're either gonna get moms or you're gonna get dads, you're not gonna get both. This happens the same way as it did during mitosis. The microtubules are attached to the kinetochores which fold back upon the spindle fibers shortening them. Okay, so during cytokinesis, you're gonna produce two haploid cells Cytokinesis remembers division of the cytoplasm, and we already separated moms and dads pairs. So you've already reduced. So now you're at haploid, meaning only one set of chromosomes versus diploid, two sets of chromosomes. The sister chromatids are still attached to each other. 
and they are attached at the centromere. So during prophase two, um, the microtubules are going to once again attach to those sister chromatids at their kinetochores. The metaphase one sister chromatid, I'm sorry, metaphase two sister chromatids line up at the equator once again. So this time you have sisters facing opposite poles versus homologs facing opposite poles. So again, if you say homolog, you know your meiosis one. If you're referring to sisters, you know your meiosis two. So the sisters line up at the equator and in anaphase two, the sisters are pulled apart. And just like mitosis, once they're apart, they're no longer considered sisters. That's a relationship. They're in their own cell. They're independent of each other. They're considered chromosomes. So then once again, in telophase two, you have nuclear envelopes, there you go, forming around each of your four nuclei. So now you have four haploid cells and we call them gametes, right? So then for reproduction, two gametes need to come together and a haploid and a haploid will make a diploid, right? So you have a diploid zygote. So other, um, other organisms will We'll go through this process differently, and we're going to see that in the life cycle. So we might refer to spores. So that haploid cell may develop into a spore before it develops into a gamete. So we're going to see that in a little bit. Um, so we have reduction during meiosis, and then fertilization restores the chromosome number. You should be able to explain, describe how the chromosome number is kept constant through sexual reproduction. So that would require you talking about the reduction in meiosis and then the restoration of numbers during fertilization. Should also be able to talk about how you're able to create genetic variation through sexual reproduction, which again is going to include meiosis as well as the actual fertilization. Okay, so every organism, sperms may not be the same. This is just quite interesting. And when we get into evolution, we'll talk about mechanical isolation. So mechanical isolation, parts have to fit together. So um, like an opossum's sperm looks very different than a human sperm. So um, an opossum sperm is only going to fertilize an opossum egg. And the same with check out the crayfish and I can't even tell the fruit flies sperm. They look like worms to me. Okay, so in um, sex ed, we talked about spermatogenesis and oogenesis and your book talks about it as well. So maybe we're just recognizing that they don't happen the same way, right? They're slightly different. So again, the germ cell is the cell in the gonad that produces the gametes. Um, through the process of spermatogenesis, you have a primary spermatocyte before you go through your meiosis. And then a secondary spermatocyte after the first round of meiosis. And then finally, that divides again to form spermatids. And it's not till after maturation that they um, gain their ability to swim and therefore are considered a sperm. Okay, so in um, the male version, we get all four daughter cells. In the female version, we only get one, okay? So they don't happen the same. We still have our primary oocyte, first division, secondary oocyte before the second division. Each time the cell divides, it does not divide evenly. So we're talking about cytoplasm and nutrients. So this does not divide evenly, which gives the surviving cell the best chance at survival, since this egg is going to have to support a whole new being, right? Okay, so it divides unevenly to give this one more material for the future offspring. Happens again in the second division, and again, it divides unevenly. So you have a first polar body that will then go through apoptosis and divide and uh, disintegrate basically. And then you have secondary oocyte divides again unevenly, secondary polar site once, polar body once again will go through apoptosis and disintegrate. Okay, so that gives the, 
the final egg or ovum the greatest chance of survival. Any questions so far? That's all old news to you. This is the new news, okay? So the life cycles we have not talked about yet. So life cycle is basically like at what point or what form does the adult version of an organism exist? And its adult version is its multicellular version, right? So um, a diploid life cycle, the majority of your life is spent as a diploid cell. So we only exist, for example, as a haploid cell, as a gamete. Our adult version, our multicellular version is diploid, right? So our entire life is spent as a diploid cell. So you have um, the haploid cells, this is us. They come together through fertilization to form a zygote. And from that point on, you are diploid. The diploid cell will continue to replicate through mitosis until it's ready to become a zygote again, and then it goes through meiosis. So you wanna know where in each of these cycles the diploid and the haploid versions are, and where mitosis and meiosis are. Okay, so diploid is easy because it's what we do. Haploid is a little more difficult because we're less familiar with things that are not us. So in this case, they're spending the majority of their life as a haploid cell. Their multi-cell multi version, or in some cases it's unicellular like a yeast, um, would be in, that, in the haploid cell. Okay, so the ones that are most common are fungi and algae. And then, um, so you wanna kind of orientate yourself. Here's the diploid version. So meiosis will divide and form haploid cells. And so the, this is going to be then the free living cell. This is the adult version. And it spends its life as a haploid cell. It'll go through mitosis to make more of itself or to make more cells. It will, at the last point of its life, go through fertilization where it fuses. Now it's a diploid cell again. And then it'll go through meiosis to produce new cells that are haploid. It's kind of opposite. Each of these life cycles for me is best to draw them out. When I was taking tests about these questions, I would have to have it, like I'd draw it out and then I'd answer the questions because my mind gets lost somewhere in that cycle. So if I draw it out first, I can let my brain take, you know, relax and just look. This is the tricky one. This is the one you'll spend a little bit more time with today. This is the haploid diploid life cycle. Holy cow. Like, where do you even start? So let's find our spores. We have microspores and we have megaspores. Okay, and they come from a sporophyte. So in this one, you have gametophytes and sporophytes. Um, the first part of the word is telling you what it's going to produce, basically. So the sporophyte produces spores. So this is your mature flower. It is diploid. It will then go through meiosis to divide the chromosome number in half. Okay, so the sporophyte is going to make spores. The male version is the microspore and the female version is the megaspore. Just like the sperm is much smaller than the egg, right? So micro versus mega. The microspore, so at this point I'm already haploid. I cannot divide a haploid cell again. So now it goes through mitosis. So it's gonna spend some time as a haploid cell or as a haploid organism. So it forms a pollen grain and then um, through mitosis, it will continue to um, form new cells until it is able to produce um, the pollen. So this is the pollen tube forming the pollen. And then over here is our megaspore that will then form ovules and it forms the egg, okay? So this is its haploid cell version. Um, and then fertilization occurs and we're back to a diploid. So it's form a zygote. 
And then that goes through fertilization, or I'm sorry, mitosis at this point to continue making more cells until it's forming a mature sporophyte. So we should have had a gametophyte on this word so on here somewhere. Um, I don't see our plant cell being called a gametophyte. We're going to see that in another example though. Okay, so let's watch this. As with all land plants, the life cycle of an angiosperm alternates between a diploid sporophyte generation, represented here by the flower of the mature sporophyte plant, and a haploid gametophyte generation. Within the flower's male parts, called the anthers, are millions of diploid cells called microsporocytes. These microsporocytes divide by meiosis to produce haploid microspores. Meanwhile, a similar process occurs within the flower's female parts, which consist of one or more carpels. In this example, the single carpel consists of a stigma, style, ovary, and ovule. A single diploid megasporocyte exists in the ovule and divides by meiosis to produce four haploid megaspores, only one of which survives. By producing two different types of spores, the microspores and megaspores, angiosperms and all other seed plants are considered heterosporous. Each microspore undergoes a mitotic division and differentiation to produce a pollen grain. A pollen grain is the haploid male gametophyte called a microgametophyte. The surviving megaspore divides by mitosis to produce seven haploid cells. One large, centrally located cell contains two nuclei called polar nuclei. Another cell is the egg. The seven-celled structure makes up the female gametophyte called the megagametophyte. The pollen grain pollinates the female parts of the flower by landing on the stigma. Here, the pollen grain germinates and a pollen tube grows down the style until it meets the female gametophyte. Two sperm from the pollen grain travel through the pollen tube and enter the female gametophyte. One fertilizes the egg, forming a diploid zygote. The other fertilizes two polar nuclei, forming a triploid cell. The fertilization of both the egg cell and the central cell is called double fertilization, a hallmark of the life cycle of angiosperms. The zygote, which begins the next sporophyte generation, develops into the embryo, while the triploid cell develops into the nutritive endosperm of the seed. The seed germinates, and when the sporophyte matures, the life cycle begins again. That video does a much better job at explaining um, the haploid, diploid life cycle. You might want to visit that again. Your book barely mentions, um, well, it mentions it, but it, it doesn't really explain the haploid, diploid life cycle. It refers to the gametophyte and the sporophyte, and that's about it. And that is in section 10.5. So that's where you find these life cycles. So haploid life cycle, pretty easy. Diploid life cycle, very easy. Um, the haploid diploid life cycle, more difficult, which is why I give you one thing to do with that today. You'll need to enable your Adobe Flash Player for this, um, but you have some reading, very, not a lot, right? A little bit of reading here. And um, you're going to put these um, pictures into the proper order. Fern is a very common example of the haploid diploid or alternation of generations. Um, you'll have some questions to answer and there should be a print. Yeah. Um, here we go. Here, they, under the journal, you'll have five questions to answer. Okay. Um, and when you're done, you should be able to hit print. For me, I get um, them all on one page and I'm able to print them to a PDF or a Google Drive. Um, my freshmen haven't been able to figure that out when they did this site. Um, maybe you guys can, or maybe it truly is not an option on the um, Google Chrome, in which case you can just print this, okay? Um, but if you could figure that out, that'd be great. Then I can pass that information along to them. But if you save it as a PDF, it saves it to your um, computer and then you can upload that or save it to the Google Drive and then you can just, you know, click it and, and drag it. 
Okay, so that's our follow up for today. That isn't, um, that shouldn't take you too long. That's what I want turned in today. I'm going to skip. Um, I have this interesting jellyfish video. I'll just put it in the link, but I, I've already kind of gone over our time, so I don't want to keep going. Um, so I'll put that link in there for you later. And then you have the, um, I told you, you have a case study for homework. Oops. So under the Google world, we have this case study, which comes up as a PowerPoint. And you, then you have a worksheet um, to answer questions on. So the SRY gene, um, that determines whether you become male or female um, physically. So males should be born with the SRY gene and it expresses at week seven, I think. And then um, that begins all of the male formation. And if that gene is not expressed, um, then you continue on your course as a female. Okay. So onion root tip, a few of you still needed stats maybe. Now you have that. We've done the video. We're going to spend a little time with life cycles and then you have a case study. So with that, what questions do you have? 